Hi, everybody. Thanks for joining us. Uh, my name is Jack Orr. I'm the uh, Offshore One Design Coordinator for North Sales in North America. And uh, pretty exciting to get a group of guys like this together to talk about J111s. I have a, a couple of J111 clients that sell mostly handicap, not so much uh, One Design, but uh, hoping to work into that. So it's great to have Seedon Wiesen from uh, San Francisco, past North American champion, sales on Skeleton Key, very active in the class. Jeremy Smart from uh, Gosport in the UK, uh, one of our top guys over there, multiple times sailing in World Championship Regattas. And Alter Hewn from uh, Annapolis, uh, also very active in the class in Chicago and Annapolis. Uh, he's also the chairman for the uh, North American Regatta coming up in the fall in Annapolis. So uh, I can't think of a better group to sit around uh, after a day of sailing and having a beer and talking about uh, J111. So Alan's going to uh, be the moderator for this and he's going to be watching for questions uh, through the chat room and hopefully we'll have time to answer some of those. But these guys have so much info. Uh, we'll be uh, we're probably going to have to make this into two parts. So, uh, Alan, take it away. Thanks, Jack. Uh, hope everyone is doing well out there, and we're glad to be here today to talk a little bit about uh, some J111 sailing. But before we, we talk a little bit, um, you know, we ask everyone before we talk through these uh, presentations uh, not to forget to support your class, and, and the J111 class is no different. So, if you're an owner or crew, uh, you know, pay your dues this year. You know, the classes are still trying to function and, you know, we all love sailing J111. So anything we can do to help keep the class going um, is great. And hopefully, you know, we're looking forward to some good regattas still later in the year. I know Jeremy was telling us that the worlds are still on the docket here for, I think, end of the summer in England. And the North Americans are going to be later in the fall in Annapolis, and, and we're hoping to get these regattas going. So uh, without further ado, uh, let's do a little chatting about some J111 sailing. So uh, we're going to talk about, you know, going upwind here first, and, and here's a good shot from the Worlds in Chicago uh, coming off the starting line. And um, we're going to bring Seedon in first here to talk to us. So we've gotten off the starting line. Boats going. What are a couple things you like to think about here as we uh, get going upwind? Yeah, thanks, Alan. Um, this is a great shot of uh, of the worlds in Chicago. Had the tight racing, a good start line. Um, I mean, right away in this breeze, it's probably looks to be about eight nine knots of breeze. You want to power the boat up to get the most you can out of point and speed. And uh, I like this photo because you can see. The guys in the uh, blue shirts to lured USA 12, the cashmere, you can see how they're, they're healed over, poked out. They're really maximizing uh, their point and hiking, having something hard to hike against. Basically, they have a lot of power in their sail plan. Uh, if you go uh, to weather um, the Warlock there with the bow 60, they're just not hiking very hard. The boat's not healing. They don't have a lot of power. Um, likely not enough punch in their main um, and maybe not enough traveler and then and then you look to weather and you see the velocity with, with a real nice start but also uh, crews not hiking near as hard the boats pretty flat uh, so probably lacking some power with uh, lack of main sheet trim and probably not enough traveler so you know getting that boat to heel over to point um, off the line is is critical. If the boat is too flat, then the bow wants to go down, and you're not going to point very well. You're going to lose lose your lane pretty quickly off the line. Uh, and if you don't have anything for the crew really hike against, then the boat's just not going to go very fast forward. So two two critical things are are to make sure you have power to point off the line and power to go fast forward. So, see, just in listening to you talk there, it seems like one of the things that's maybe slightly counterintuitive is that you need to actually load the boat up to have something to hike against, right? I mean, we're always told to sail the boat flat, which is what you're trying to do, but 
what you're saying is you got to almost trim harder to get the boat to heel so you can hike. Is that? Absolutely. Yeah, no, that's, yeah. that's exactly it. You want to find, you want to get that boat to heel over to get it to point and give the crew something to hike against. And, um, you know, you, your main trim, your main traveler and your backstay are three critical controls to uh, allowing the boat to do that. Got it. Yeah, uh, you can then, really see in this photo, guys, like everybody's sort of sail depths are very similar. But but for sure, like you say, Stephen, uh, the trim on the main is different. Like velocities looks pretty twisted compared to uh, to 12 down there uh, poking up. Yeah. So, so we already have a question from uh, Mark Haas. Uh, Stephen, when you say the traveler – not enough traveler do you mean the traveler's too low or the traveler's too high and you need to trim harder yeah what exactly do you mean by that? when i say not enough traveler i mean the traveler's too low it needs to be pulled up higher uh to get the boat to heel over a little bit more got it and and are you guys um okay with having the boom say above center line or anything like that to help induce these things yeah absolutely um i mean there's enough twist in these sails even when you sheet it in pretty firm that if the boom is above center line the majority of the main sails below the center right. line and you're really again trying to maximize the power and the point of the boats off the line yeah and it's Got almost it. like the track is you know the car itself you know you can pull the car quite high before the boom gets on center line right so in real light air, sometimes it even seems like the track's not big enough. Yeah, I mean, the, the boats are relatively narrow aft. The travelers are not very long. Um, so you don't have a lot of range with the traveler in general anyways. Got it. Well, let's go to the, uh, the next page, and, and we'll bring Jeremy in here, because I think he's uh, sailing on this boat. Hold on. Hold on. Let's see if I can figure out how to do this here. Um, this is, this is, uh, is this the boat you were sailing on, Jeremy? Is this the McFly here? Yeah. Yeah. Hi, Alan. Yeah, that's uh, McFly. That I sail on quite regularly. Yeah. And uh, so, you know, let's just, we'll watch this video and we can play it a couple times, but let's just talk about, you know, light to medium air here. Some of the sail trim things that you guys are both looking at um, as we go. So here we go. And we'll, I'll run this a couple times. It's a short video. Yeah, so in this sort of light medium winds, you know, we've got guys hiking out. So like Seedon was saying earlier, we're, we're looking to get, um, you know, maximum power into the rig and get the boat tipping over so the guys have really got something to hike against. So as you can see, the travellers, you know, above the centre line with a boom on the centre line. Uh, and we've got, you know, reasonably powerful um, sail shapes just to try and get the boat uh, tipped over and powered up so the guys can really get out hiking. Right, so if you're looking here, you're basically saying th this is the part of the boom that you're looking at is to be on center line, right? Yeah. And, and yeah. even though the traveler, you know, down in here is above, you're still trimming the boom on center line. On, yeah, on trying to get it on or slightly above center line would be the aim here uh, with the main traveler and um, boom position. And um, yeah, you've probably got moderate amount of backstay on here, probably about 40%, 45% backstay. You're still keeping the main cell fairly, fairly powered up. Um, and then on the head cell trim, you know, we've got the in haulers in, so inside the handrail on the J111, that's a pretty good guide. Uh, that handrail gives you a good sort of uh, visual uh, for in haul positions. So we've got the, you know, the in haulers in just inside there, um, again, to, you know, give us, a, give us some power and height. I'm going to pause it right here. Um, hopefully I can. So, you know, Stephen, just look at this, a, a couple things here in this trim. Um, you know, obviously the in-haulers are pretty key setup. And if you look at this, you know, you can see it's pretty far in-hauled. But what are you looking at, too, as you go up the rig at the spreaders for the jib trimmers out there, you know, in, in this type of breeze? Yeah, so the one real important thing to look at is um, how open the jib is at the bottom and the top spreaders. And one thing I notice here... Uh, a little bit. The jib is a little bit, the leech is a little open on the spreaders and the one control that really makes a difference there is your jib halyard tension. Now for the condition this boat sailing in, the halyard tension and the trim may be, be optimum, but the one thing you can really move that leech around by just adjusting your halyard 
uh, a turn, three quarters of a turn on the winch. Got it. Yeah, and it seems like these sails are pretty high aspect, so the halyard's quite important, um, especially with the 3D I sails. You know, you can manage a lot of it with the halyard. It, it is, and if you're again, you know, kind of going back to the start a little bit, and if you're in a lane where you need to point, you may not have that halyard on real tight off the line. But once you get free and you're in a more fast forward mode, you know, pulling that halyard on a little bit, push the draft forward and open the leech a little, and you know, be, have the ability to put the bow down. These are all small changes that you can make, but critical to your boat speed. So Jack, you know, I'm watching, I'm gonna play the video again here, but in one of the things I'm watching it, the helm is moving, you know, a very little bit. And you've sailed on a ton of different J-boats and with different owners. And what are some of the things you work on, you know, just in watching this to make sure that happens? I mean, if you look, the wheel's not even moving. Yeah, it's, yeah, I mean, for sure, the, the optimum, amount that you want to move the rudder is really no more than four degrees. So it's kind of good, you know, this boat doesn't have it, but a lot of boats make a mark on either side of the center uh, so they can see what four degrees is and that's like about a foot or eight inches or something. You'd have to do it on the hard, but um, it's pretty it's pretty easy to see for the um, trimmers and everything if the, the wheel is turned too much then that's an indication that, you know, you're either going to heal too much or, or you're, uh, you know, you're out of balance there. So, um, and, and keeping it flat and keeping the sails trimmed in, obviously the boat, the, the great thing about the J111 is when everything is socked in and trimmed in properly, the boat sort of drives itself. Yeah, it really does. And, and in looking at that, we'll, we'll kind of go to the next slide here and, Crew weight, you know, we've already talked about it two or three times, seems to be a, a crucial part of the equation. Uh, so, I mean, Jeremy, you, you were either in this photo or took it as well. So, you know, what do you see in this photo, just in terms of where the crew is, how the boat's in the water that you think is important? Yeah, so in these sort of conditions here, uh, with the crew weight's position to um, you know, keep the knuckle of the boat in the, in the water, it's just, you know, popping out occasionally, but generally, you know, maximizing the full woodline length for the J111. Um, the boat's nicely powered up, all the crew, you know, hiking well. Um, but yeah, that's what the, the, the position along the rail of the, of the crew weight is, we'll be looking at that knuckle and just making sure that that's not popping out too much as we go through the waves. No social distancing here, huh? Yeah, no, not really. no socially distancing environment. Everybody's <laughs> friends. No, it does so, Jeremy, are you the one prairie dogging there? Uh, that, yeah, that's, that's me. Not hiking. Yeah, that's good. <laughs> that's, the only one good. not hiking out. That's me. Yeah, the only yeah, one not hiking out. That's the snail maker usually, right? Yeah, that's yeah. that's an important one. So, uh, see, and actually, I have a question for you about this photo. So, one of the things that kind of um, I take away from sailing the J111 that's a little bit like a J70 is it doesn't seem like you can sail like by feathering through the jib. If if you're sailing this condition, you got to be pressed on the jib and keep a boat flat in a different way, right? Yeah. So maybe if you want to chat a little bit about that, because even in this condition in eight to 12 knots of breeze, let's say, yeah. you never really want to sail inside the jib, right? You always want to keep the boat going. Right. So No, exactly. The boat does not like to point for very long. Um, you like to press on the jib, you know, use, use your main to kind of provide your lift and press on the jib and keep the boat going consistently. Consistent. I think the most important thing is really keeping your speed consistent and your your height will come from that. Uh, if you try to feather on the jib, you can get away with it longer on a condition like in this photo where the water is really flat, but after time the boat is just going to slow down. Um, the, so common mistakes that I see is really over trimming the jib and, and ro over inhauling and really trying to maximize the height because the boat does not like to point. It just likes to go consistently the same speed. Yeah, and it seems to me, and I don't know how you guys all feel about this, but the, the crucial control in this setup is actually the backstay, right? I mean, as soon as you feel like the boat's struggling, you just put a couple pumps of the backstay on and the boat seems to be able to go bow down and just take off it is kind of what I've felt is quite good. Yeah. I don't know if you guys have felt the same thing. But. Yeah, no, I, I completely agree. The backstay control is actually really critical. And as soon as you see the guys on the rail, I mean, his crew is doing a nice job giving Jeremy some vision up the course. Um, 
And as soon as you see the boat, you know, you feel the boat get flat and the crew starts to raise their head. I mean, the main trimmer and the helmsman, if they see the crew starting to raise their heads because the boat's getting too flat, ease the backstay a little bit and all of a sudden the boat will heel back over and then sort of refine your main trim and get the boat going again. And the same, if the boat starts to heel too much, feels like you have to feather the boat to keep it flat, keep it going, then a couple pumps on the backstay and the boat will accelerate again and track and become much more balanced. One thing I would say in, the, in these sort of conditions and yeah, particularly off the line, um, you need really good communication between the, uh, the helmsman and the main sheet trimmer. That's really key. Obviously it's owner drive the class in the J111, um, but it's really got to come from the helmsman. He's got the confidence to say, you know, how the boat's feeling, can he take a bit more power? Um, and that just comes with steering the boat and getting a bit of a feel for it, an instinct for it. And, you know, the, then the helmsman can feed back to the main sheet trimmer saying, yeah, I need a bit more power, I need a bit of traveler up, or you know, I've got a bit too much power now. You know, you can pump a bit of backstay on or a bit of down traveler. And just like you were saying, just keep that, keep that boat speed consistently high. And we found a lot with the J111 sometimes, you get different main sheet trimmer on, they can be holding the traveler a little bit too high. You just drop it down a couple of inches in these sort of conditions and the boat's off again. So you just got to be uh, a bit careful to not sort of choke the boat out with having the traveler too high. Yeah, and this is one of those cases too, guys. We're just looking at this photo, you know, going back to what Seaton's saying about the pointing. Like one way to sort of help the whole point situation when you're in this, you know, powered up condition like this is to make sure the head stays straight, right? That sucks the sail up that much tighter up against the rig than the whole sail plan wants to go a little higher. So, um, you know, everybody's always asking us about the tuning and, and this would be a case where if you, if McFly was sailing around in this condition and they had the shrouds, um, you know, one setting loose and the head stay was sagging more, they, they wouldn't be looking this grand. Yeah, it, I agree with you, Jack. These medium conditions, yeah. So it's like you could almost hedge to the, you know, to the, do you guys feel like you could hedge to the tight side a little bit in these moderate conditions? Just in that it depends on the sea point state. even better. Yeah, like in the solar better. where it's really flat like this, we can sail with quite, you know, relatively hard rig and we can sheet the sails uh, quite tight on the leeches because uh, it's always flat, you know, it's generally flat water in these conditions in the solar. But if you're uh, somewhere with a sloppy sea state, like a leftover swell, so in the same sort of breeze, you'd have to set up with a quite a different setup, you know, a bit of a softer rig, um, more twist in the sails, just not shoot them so hard. So, yeah, the different wind speed, like medium breeze, you can set up quite differently depending on the on the sea state that you're sailing in. Yeah, Jack, I, I agree with what you're saying. I, I the way I thought about it is it's it's like a lot of J boats. It's underpowered until it's not right. Right. So, so if the crew, it, to me, if the crew is hiking full time, I'll tend to err on the tight side if I'm not sure what to do. But as soon as I feel like they're not hiking full time, I err on the looser side. I, I don't, I think Seaton and I've talked about this quite a bit. I think he's pretty similar in, in that part of setup. Um, but I think that's one of the things. So um, got a couple questions for you, uh, for you guys. Um, first one is when you're working the main sheet, are you working the traveler at the same time? How do you guys split that up? So seeing if you're the main trimmer. Yeah, if the water's flat, um, then you're working the traveler more and the main sheet less. And if the water is, uh, you know, lumpy, choppy, or if you have uh, wake, you know, from other boats and so on, then you're tending to play the uh, main sheet a little bit more and just setting the traveler. Got it. Totally makes sense. And I, I got another question here for you guys. So we know we've gotten a little bit into rig tune, but not a ton. So what do you guys do when you feel like you're out of tune? What is the first thing you guys go for? And what, what do we look to do when we get in that situation? Well, I mean, you, if you're sailing or if, if you're in the middle of the race, you got to sort of live with it, right? But if right. you have but, time in between, you got to try to get back you know, to where, you know, where you were to the base closest as you yeah. think you can get. Yeah. You know, so. But I think is, let's just say we're mid-race, the wind goes from 10 to 12 to 16. 
you know, what is your go-to for this boat to get it back the way you need to? I mean, for me, the first thing I'm doing is obviously we talked about the backstay, but, but generally after that, I don't know, I'd be curious to hear what you two say is I'm actually adjusting the inhaler quite a bit at that point. Yeah. Because if the main starts blowing up, that's got to be your first adjustment. I don't know what you yeah, guys. Yeah, I, I would go, uh, you know, backstay, bang. Bang's pretty critical, getting the main flat. And then uh, jib halyard, uh, jib cars, and inhalers. That, I mean, that's all, all, almost all the controls, but and yeah. it may vary in order depending on the sea state and the situation that you're in. But there's actually a lot of, a lot of controls uh that you can play with um yeah so we actually got uh we'll go to the next page here uh let's see if my thing works now let me see if i can still get through it here so we got a video here we'll show it's a little bit windier now but we're also going to show attack so we'll, we'll play this and you guys can talk through it as we're going it's i think it's a pretty long video um but we got a minute worth of upwind medium-ish breeze and some tacking so no, it's not going to want to play. Well, as this is coming up, so let's talk about, so it's gotten a little windier. So now what are a couple of things that you're thinking about now that's a little windier, like in this photo video? Boat's healing more, got more load on the helm. So, you know, talk yeah. about what are some of the things you guys do. So as the breeze sort of picks up, you know, a couple of knots more pressure now and, uh, you look into yeah, as you, as Stephen was saying earlier, get that backstay is the main is the main control really for depowering the main cell. You know, it's it's quite a strong feature on the 111. Really flattens out the main um, nice and quick. And if you've got if you're carrying a bit too much heel, then you know, get a bit of backstay on. Um, and the boats really really do like that. Yeah. So looking at this photo, so here we are. You know, it's blowing on a what 15, we'll say in this and. Um, you know, you look at the boats pretty healed over, the guys are hiking, but they're going into attack here in this breeze. So what are a couple things when you're going into attack that you're you're focused on if you're on this boat? Just Besides, focus on getting all the crew to move across the boat together and, and get out hiking on the new side as much as possible in terms of the crew weight. And then, yeah, looking to sort of get, get the jib trimmed in. Don't put it in too quickly, but get it, get it trimmed in and, and uh, work on getting the boat up to speed again as soon as possible. So your yeah, helm pressing down a bit on the, on the jib and just, like you will say, leaning on the jib a little bit and getting that boat speed back up again. Got it. So, seeing in this boat, you can see they're not cross-sheeting the jib. How, how critical do you think that is if, to do? I think cross-sheeting is, is critical. I think you've got a cross sheet. Um, it keeps the crew weight on the high side, bringing the jib. It allows uh, more adjustment coming out of the tack. You know, here you have the trimmer still doing sort of final trim where he could be doing that from the rail. And in flat water, it's maybe not as, as critical because you bring the jib in pretty much to its final setting and then you go hike pretty quickly. But if you're sailing in lumpier conditions, you want to leave the jib out. When we cross sheet, um, you know, we have, uh, I, I, I'm in the tactician role and I, I release, we have one person take the sheet, another person come and grind most of the way in. And then I, I hop up and take the tail and then bring the last three, four or five inches in uh, as the boat is is building up to speed, whereas if you're tacking this way with your sheet to leeward, you're not you don't have the ability to make those adjustments. Another nice feature of cross sheeting is that if you're ducking or if you get some big waves, um, that you can ease the jib a little bit, change gears, and then bring it back in. And that's uh, that that's pretty critical, especially uh, you know for example if you're on a ley line and maybe you're real pressed on the ley line, you have some boats under you or so on, the ability to make some adjustments to the jib trim uh, to keep the boat going fast or keep the boat pointing is, is pretty critical. So cross sheeting, I think, is a must. And, and just double checking, because I got the question, 
uh, Jeremy, it, it, it is okay in the class rules, so there's no reason you couldn't do that. Yeah, right? I think there was always some confusion about it because the, the UK boat, uh, the European boats weren't, they don't come set up for cross sheeting with the blocks, I think that the American boats do. Um, so I think there was a bit of a query about it a few years back and, and um, yeah, it's probably a, uh, something that the, U the European fleet aren't really uh, doing as much as the American fleet for sure and probably an area for improvement going forward. So looking at this video, I got it paused here and we'll show it again here in a second. But, you know, what would you guys say, just look at this and, and Jack, you can jump in on this probably is, you know, looking at the heel angle here, even coming out of attack, it's the boat looks pretty heeled over to me. So what are some of the things, you know, you would do to a get the boat flatter? And do you agree that the boat's heeled over too much? Well, it might be heeled over a little bit too much initially yeah. because you got to get the speed right away. Right. So, and let, and it's not it's not very easy to sort of adjust the backstay um, that quickly. So, mm -hmm. so you might have to live with it for just a minute. But I'll bet you these guys get right up flat fairly quickly. Got it. One thing I would say is pretty critical when you start to get in the medium and heavier conditions, um, especially in waves. It's important that the main trimmer has the main sheet in his hands. So if the boat comes out of the tack too heeled over, maybe the helmsman steered the boat too low out of the tack, maybe the crew didn't get out on the rail fast enough, is that he has the ability to drop the main sheet and let the main out to keep the boat um, a little more flat, a little more level coming out of the tack. If you're too heeled over, the boat is not gonna accelerate very well. You gotta get the keel to, to bite and to lift and if there's a lot of heel, the boat's gonna go sideways for a few seconds before the keel starts to lift. And, um, you know, easing the main out is gonna make the boat uh, basically start pointing a little bit better uh, and building speed a little, little bit better out of the tack. So my other takeaway, just looking at this photo and I'll jump in, is just looking at the inhauler there. So, you know, it looks like he's just inside the handrail is that a normal setting in both of your mind or where, how would you be managing that part of it? I would say that's, um, that's a sort of fair, that's a pretty standard position, I would think, for being a hall in this sort of condition. Um, yeah, generally around about there, you might be looking to give it a slight little click out just about, you know, as, as the breeze picks up. But I think, you know, once the boat gets going in this, um, in this sort of video, and all the all the weights back up on the rail, uh, the heel isn't isn't so bad. Um, but what I would say is that if in the when you are sailing along in these sort of conditions and you you're trying to keep the boat in the groove, obviously yeah, you do occasionally have to ease the main or ease the traveller, but you want to do really small adjustments with this. you rather than a big ease because if you do too much of an ease to try and uh, get the boat back on its feet, then you're always trying to sort of you never get in the groove again. So just small movements on the traveler or on the main sheet just keeps it in the groove a bit better. Right, so I mean, just to look at this too, I mean, traveler's pretty high, which is probably good, right? Keeps it pretty twisty so the boat does get back on its feet quicker. And you're right, you're looking at the jib there for the inhaler. So one of the things I always think about is if the boat struggles, and I think Seed mentioned this before, is you know to ease the inhaler to help get the bow down and get the boat to re-accelerate a little bit if if you can i don't know if that's something you guys also do or not but we talk yeah, about sure. it on our boat quite a bit yeah yeah definitely yeah so um we'll finish this video but we're going to go to the next video which is really cool it's an over the head drone video and it'll take a second to load so i'm going to move forward but we're talking to breezier you'll have a couple boats so if you guys can talk us through this um so I believe this is, wh where was this uh, video? Uh, this is the world's um, 2018 in, uh, in Holland. So this is the start of one of the races here, right? Yeah, this is the start line and it's a, it's a bit more pressure now uh, than in the other videos. You sort of probably 17, 18 knots, but uh, most of the boats, there's a couple of boats on the J3, but most of the boats on the, on the J2. Got it. So we'll, we'll play this along and you guys can all jump in and comment as we go here. Yeah, so one of the things I think to look at in this uh, video 
as, as the drone sort of pans over the back of the fleet, you can see some different setups in how they've got the, um, the main sheet, uh, the main setup, and uh, also how the main and the jib are working together. Uh, so it's quite, looking at the boat there with the 3DL sails in the middle, um, he's made a nice start and he's got a, got a fairly comfortable lane there at the moment. Um, but as the video plays out, you can just see how probably because of his trim on the sails being too, too open, too twisted, he's losing height the whole time. Uh, and the boat below him, which is Jelvis, has got a much flatter mainsail and, and slightly tied to leeches, and they're just gaining that few degrees of, uh, of height on the boat to windward. So now he's really starting to get in his gas. And as you can behind here and, and see the, uh, the, the shapes of the sails, you can see how, how one is much more twisted than the other and uh, how one is much more set up much flatter. Yeah, and looking at that photo, it, it's pretty apparent to me too, the boat to leeward, the crew is definitely hiking harder. And I think it's one of those things that I don't think the crew can ever hike hard enough in this boat. It's like, <laughs> that, yeah. that is absolutely true. H hiking is the key uh, yeah. to getting the J111 around the course quickly. You can't, you just yeah. can't hike hard enough. You've got to hike the whole time yeah. uh, to get the best out of the boat. Yeah, Seaton and I are definitely the weak links when it comes to that, I think. <laughs> <laughs> but here, we'll back this up a little bit and then we'll play it again and, and we'll talk through whatever else we see here. But this is a pretty cool video because it's quite choppy as well, it looks like. Yeah, in this but, sort of conditions, it was choppy and there's some, there's some there's a lot of waves. Um, so really good communication needed between the crew and the, uh, and the helm and the main sheet uh, in terms of like uh, gusts coming in. So the helmsman can anticipate if, if he knows there's a gust coming in, then um, the, the main sheet I like, can get ready for a slight ease and the helmsman can get ready for a slight feather up. That sort of communication is really key off the line like this. Yeah, I think one of the things that you notice is that the two lead boats, um, the amount that the boat moves through the water is a lot less than some of the other boats that aren't going as fast. And that's, they ha they're, both balanced a little bit more. Obviously the crews are hiking, sails are trimmed in harder, but they just have a better balance and their speed is more consistent. Uh, and what you're seeing with the boats that are struggling a little bit is they probably have some moments where they're going quite well and then they have moments where they really uh, fall off the pace and it just takes a while to get going. Um, and, and no doubt it, you know, the waves really are changing um, how these boats are sailing. So it's critical to have a setup to get through these waves consistently, you know, consistent heel angle and really, you know, helmsman and the main trimmer focusing on, on keeping a consistent heel angle and keeping the boat from going up or down too much. So one of the other things, just looking at where it's paused right here, and Jeremy, you mentioned this before, so it, it's clear to me the boats with the bigger jibs are getting through the chop a little better here, right? Because they're the two boats that appear to be punched out off this line. So, you know, how do you, and I got this question in the chat sent to me privately, how do you choose which one to use and, and how do you make that decision? Yeah, it's a, it's a tough call um, in this sort of wind speed where it's um, 18, maybe you're getting some 20 knot gusts come through, which one to go for? Um, yeah, because you're going to be overpowered with the J2, you know, some of the time. Um, and the J3 is probably an easier sail. Yeah, it feels easier to steer to, but I think lots of the guys with the J3s, the boat, they, you know, in the, in the warm up, they were probably felt like they were doing fine. Um, but as soon as you line up with another boat, they were really struggling for height. Uh, they couldn't, the boats of the J2 in this sort of condition were much better at carrying their height, um, keeping the boat powered up through the lulls. That That's because the they're just playing going faster, right? Yeah, they're going fast. Like but they're also you, you sort of lose your, you lose your, uh, when you start to feel like you're going slow, and then then you don't point because you're, because you feel un, you know, underpowered. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it, the the boats with the smaller head sails and Jeremy, you call that the J three. Is that the heavy weather jib? Or? Yeah, that's that's okay. a heavy weather jib. Yeah, okay. no, no one actually had a had a, had a full size J three if you like. Yeah, but they're on okay. heavy weather jibs, so right. it's quite a bit smaller sail. Right, and so you know what happens is if you get slow, you really have to put the bow down 
because the jib is so much smaller. The heavy weather jib is so much smaller. You have to put the bow down to get the boat to heel over and get going again. And you really, uh, you lose consistency. You can't get through the chop near as well. So in this type of condition, we have big waves. It's better to be very overpowered with the bigger jib, with the, with the medium jib or J2 uh, than it is to be with the heavy weather jib. And you're going to have to do a lot of twisting and probably a lot of easing of inhalers and a jib sheet through some of the really breezy conditions. Again, another good reason to cross sheet. Uh, but the boat just likes the bigger jib better to get through the chop. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Set, set up for the lulls in these in these conditions for sure. Um, I'd say twenty knots is probably a, a good point for the crossover. Often. Yeah, it almost seems like it, as long as you can keep the main working most of the time, you keep the bigger jib up, right? It, you you don't switch down until you're ragging the main. It's kind of been my view of yeah. it. I don't know if that, it, it seems simplistic, but it was like, I just yeah. keep tightening the rig, tightening the rig, tightening the rig. And then if you can't, uh, can't do that, then go down to the next jib. Like that, that would be the last yeah. result. Yeah. That, yeah. That's a do good you can. Yeah. yeah. I mean, one thing when you're ragging the main too, it, the, the rigs are not super stiff. So if you're, if you're ragging the main and the mass starts moving around a lot and your head stays starts bouncing a lot and so on. And then again, you don't have that consistency um, in, in your boat speed. So, you know, so you, when you're really starting to rag the main all the time, that's the time to change, but for sure, you know, let your inhalers out, let your jib leads back, do some of the other things you can do to depower the boat before you get to that point. So we got one last question before we move on here. And one of the questions was, you know, cause you brought up the, the full size and smaller jibs is what is the normal inventory people carry, uh, you know, in a one design configuration for this boat in terms of jibs. So like if you're, if you were going to the worlds, you know, what sales would you have on the boat? Yeah. Well, for the worlds, like in Chicago or in Annapolis or Newport, you know, or most anywhere, but San Francisco, you would carry a, what we call a, a light medium or a J1, a medium heavy or a J2, and then you're required to carry the heavy weather jib. That would be your inventory. For San Francisco, we carried a, a J2, a J3, and a heavy weather jib. And um, Jeremy, you can speak for Holland and for the UK, um, what, what you would you carry? Um, yeah, most boats over here, we carry a yeah, like a light medium jib and a, and a medium heavy jib, and then the um, and then the class sort of you know heavy weather jib. Um, that's the most images. There's, there's, there's maybe one one or two boats that have got a, a full size heavy jib. But obviously, when you get when you do you when you enter the regatta, you can only carry on board two full size jibs and the heavy weather jib. So you may have three full size jibs in your inventory, but you can only choose two for the whole regatta. Yeah, and on the east coast of the U.S., for sure, Newport, Long Island Sound, the the J1 and the J2 uh, seem to be the best. Like, they're not much use for a J3 most of the time because it gets lumpy enough when it gets that windy that uh, the, go, the going to a J2 is still better. Yeah, a J3 is really probably a San Francisco-specific sail or a hindsight sail for sail in the worlds in the Solent when it blows 20. <laughs> yeah, you, you learned that one in uh, 2016, didn't you see? Sure did. Would have been nice. <laughs> Never saw the light medium. Yeah. Yeah. But one thing or more in these, in these conditions here is get, just do everything you can to get the sails. So obviously you're at the top of the range, the J2, everything you can to get the, the main sail flat, you know, maximum backstay, maximum bang, you know, rig on really firm. Yeah. Um, just do everything you can to get that main uh, flat and twisted. Gotcha. Well, I think all of our, our listeners here are already tired of hiking. You know, it's been 30 minutes of going up wind, so they're, they're getting over it. So uh, let's, let's talk about, you know, the one cool thing to me about the J111 is, is actually sailing downwind because there's so many different uh, modes and, and ways to sail the boat downwind. So let's do a little downwind chatting here. Um, and kind of go through what the different modes are and, and things that we look for. So, uh, you know, Jeremy, why don't you start us off here with some of the light air and super light air modes for a J111? 
Yeah, like you say, the, the boat, the J111 can be very rewarding uh, downwind. Lots of, you know, lots of opportunities for big gains can be made downwind in, in the light and also in the heavier planing conditions, you can really make some big gains. But in this sort of light and um, super light conditions, you know, you kind of hope you don't race in the super light conditions that often. But occasionally a race has started and it really, you know, the breeze drops right off and you can end up having to finish the race in, in three or four knots. So in the super light conditions, you know, you'd be looking for you know, the crew, you know, well forward, uh, maybe even some crew down below to sort of reduce the crew weight and reduce the pitching on the boat and the windage. Um, also aiming to get some lured heel on just to help, you know, set the sails, keep that, keep the kite pulling and keep the, um, you know, keep the main sail setting properly. Um, again, your weight, crew weight well forward uh, would be good. And obviously in the super light stuff, the main thing is just to keep the boat moving all the time. Uh, don't let the boat, you know, come to a stop and keep the flow coming over the, uh, over the asymmetric. So maybe in those super light conditions, have the main in a little bit more than you might think uh, with the vangies, just so you don't choke the flow coming off the back of the a cell and just keep that boat uh, moving nice and as quickly as you can. And so, and in this condition, all you guys agree you use the A15 for this condition? Yeah. 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 And, you know, this is a great shot because uh, uh, you can see there's only one guy really in the cockpit. And it's just like all of these J boat classes, they're all the same thing. If you you got to have the weight forward uh, up by the mast on top of the keel or a little bit forward to get that transom out of the water. Like you don't want to leave any, you know, you don't want to hear that transom slapping against the back because that's, that's just slowing the boat down. Yeah, couldn't agree with you more, Jack. I think that's one of the biggest keys for this lighter air is having your crew a forward. I mean, I think in this breeze, you know, Seaton and I were both sailing in this regatta on different boats, but we're standing at the mast doing tactics that's how far forward we're trying to get everyone to move and you know yeah, the, the, like team, the, main, the main sheet trimmer yeah. could almost be sitting to lured yeah. with the main sheet in his hand uh, up by the windows you know yeah yeah but great yeah i think everyone is pretty far forward you're right he could get further forward for sure um so two questions that we've gotten so seen when when do you switch from the a15 to the a2 um, and, and then the other one was, how do you manage your speed in this lighter air? Is it the focus of keeping the speed on and how do you decide bleeding it off and going back or what do you, what do you do in this lighter stuff? Yeah. So two good questions. Um, I would say we switch in flat water, a one five, the a two would probably be between nine and 10 knots. And if it's lumpy, then we're probably switching maybe at sort of between 10 and 11 knots. Uh, from the A15 to the A2. Um, and then, you know, the second question is a good one, and it has a lot to do with what your strategy and your tactics are. And if you need to get deep on the boats around you, or if you're trying to get forward on the boats around you. Um, I mean, generally, the courses we're sailing are mile and a quarter to a mile and three quarter long legs. And having the ability to get low on the boats around you puts you in a much more controlling position. So as long as your air is going to stay clear, we really try to soak. Uh, the only times that we wouldn't really try to soak is uh, if it's, it's very puffy, maybe there's more pressure on the outer edges of the course, or if we're really you know, trying to maintain clear lanes. Um, a lot of times when I'm going downwind, you know, coming around the weather mark, going down the the first part of the run, I'm looking for the opportunity to um, jibe in a clear lane. And so a lot of our positioning, you know, what I'll tell the helmsman uh, to do, will have to do with wh where I want to be for the next jibe. So we may sail low uh, just so we can get clearer on the next jibe, or we may stay, stay high and, pr and protect that side of the course. So it, it's really strategy, uh, tactic specific. Got it. Okay, so now it's getting a little windier. It's blowing, uh, my computer's not cooperating. Sorry for my technical difficulties. You know, this is kind of the most common J111 mode, I think, is this 
10 to 17 knots. Everyone seems to do it pretty well, uh, but we got a good video of it. So, um, you know, Jeremy, if you want to talk us through these points, then we'll go to the video, the next slide here. Yeah. Yeah, thanks, Alan. Like you're saying, a lot of people, a lot of boats can sail this mode uh, fairly well. It's a mode we sail in a lot. Um, in this downwind soaking mode, yeah, obviously, as with the other mode, you crew well forward to reduce their wetted, wetted surface. Um, but now we're starting to, rather than having to minimize movement in the light winds, we're trying to use the crew kinetics to um, help press the rail and squeeze the boat uh, a bit further downwind without using the, uh, the helm. Um, so you, you're bunching the crew up forward of the mast and they're pressing in the gusts, getting a bit of windward heel on and just hoping the belt, hoping the belt uh, slide down the waves a little bit. Um, backstay is still, you know, pretty ease, well eased. Um, and the bang tension, again, not too much bang on, just enough to stop that top bat and inverting is probably right. But the main thing here is you, you're trying to float the kite out to windward and, and get down to, you know, as low as you, as low as you can in this um, soaking mode. Let's watch this video and, and we'll talk through it here a little bit. Um, I think we got a jive and we also got just straight away sailing so we can see. Yeah. It's, it's, go ahead. So go ahead. Yeah, yeah, like you said, they roll straight into a jive here. And the, what's quite nice with the jive in this sort of condition is you help the crew hold their position you know, into the last moment and then they move into the, so, the, so they're not walking around the boat for too long. They move straight into the jive get the kite over nice and early and then the main afterwards. Yeah, so what I like there and in, in backing this up is you can see the boat heels to windward a little bit and the the driver stops the boat to get the kite through before the boom, which I think is crucial. Yeah. yeah. Just, I think in this sort of condition here, sort of, it's probably down the end of the soaking mode. It's probably 11, 12 knots, um, and um, yeah, getting that early, early, early kite over in a late main really seems to work well, and then press the boat back up to flatten yeah. it out and give yourself a bit of a boost forward. Yeah, and I'm sure Jack would agree. I mean, if it's a J109, J88, it's the same thing, right? You got to get the kite through like this. Yeah, it's well, crucial. the thing is, you you got to get um, you got to get the kite pressured up so that when the boat gets turned, that the that the main will have some pressure in it to get the batten to pop at right. the top full batten that always seems to stick on the backstay, right? It does. So, so if you do that late jibe situation like this where you can keep some pressure in the main uh, as quickly as possible, uh, it, it prevents that back, that one top batten from sticking quite as much, which of course we all hate, right? So it seems to me too, in looking at this video, you can see it here, is the crew is working pretty hard, right? If you look, they're up in the, towards the bow of the boat, they're, they're pressing against the lifeline. You can see it here as we play, just a lot of kinetics. So, you know, Seton, how, how critical do you think that is? I know your guys work pretty hard at this stuff. Yeah, no, it's real critical. Um, you know, it, you can really get discombobulated if the crew is moving around not together. And one thing I really like about this jive, which I think is just a perfect jive, is that, as, as Jeremy was saying, you know, the, notice how late the crew moves, how they move together, they get right back to their spots out of the maneuver, and then they get right back to working together. Um, if you have one guy, two guy moving one way and two guys moving the other way, it, it just doesn't work. So we really try to refine where everybody is going to sit and really um, we have kind of one person is sort of a team leader who kind of calls the kinetics and by moving the weight around with the waves then it just reduces the amount that the helmsman has to steer the boat which essentially is is your speed downwind if you're not dragging your rudder and uh, not having to uh, ease and trim your spinnaker a whole heck of a lot then your boat's going pretty fast downwind now, yes. guys, uh, some of the other, uh, like J109s, um, we like to have a guy holding the boom out, uh, maybe standing on the cabin, leaning against the boom, because it sort of tweaks the sheet, and then that guy can watch for puffs. Do you guys do that, or is that something you don't think 
No, I think, I think. Is it more important that, to have the weight out? Well, I think what happens is that, you know, the, why the late main jibe is so important is that when you're, you come out of the jibe, that's when the boat is slowest and the boat doesn't accelerate unless the spinnaker is eased, you know, is easing. And so when you do this early spinnaker, late main jibe, when the boat comes out on the new jibe, the spinnaker is, is eased all the way out. The boat is accelerating. What happens is if the main comes over a little too early because it was either pulled over too early or gravity or whatnot, helmsmen tend to turn the boat a little more rapidly and then it just sort of kills the momentum of the jibe. So having somebody hold it out may allow the helmsman to kind of hold the boat into position a little bit longer to have a better jibe. But the helmsman here, He's doing a really nice job, as, as Alan said, you know, kind of pausing in the middle of it, waiting for the spinner to get filled and then, you know, going the rest of the way. So well, I, I was thinking more just generally sailing in a straight line downwind, not so much during the jibe. Oh, right. But, yep. Yeah, we don't don't so much do that because with this, um, this is a training day here and the, the Sam Haynes uh, is a good coach, um, good sailing coach. He was coaching us this day and uh, we were just trying to get and we would do in racing as well, get the whole crew working on the kinetics. So when you get the puff, like everybody, the helmsman, the, the kite trimmer, we're all stepping to the left here and trying to press the boat. So everyone was having a little bit of an, everyone's movement was there to, when you get a puff, not just the guys on the bow pressing the rail, but everybody doing a little bit of help to yeah. try and push the yeah. boat down. I'm just watching how much the boom is sort of bouncing around on the spinnaker. Yeah. Side. Yeah, not yeah. not much on a 111 as like on a 109 or a or a 105. Yeah. Uh, 111 is a little more powered up, so you don't have that issue near as much. So one of the things that's kind of I don't say new, but it, it's gaining in popularity here is this whole wing on wing concept, and we got a pretty cool video to show it. And I think there's time and places for it, but um, you know, one of you guys want to run us through this bullet points here, and then we can watch the video. Um, I think maybe Jeremy, you put these together too, these points. Yeah, okay, sure. Um, yep. Yeah, the wing on wing isn't something that's got uh, massively um, popular in the 111 class yet, like it has in the J70 class, for example. It's not a mode that, that people often sail for a whole leg, but um, I think it's definitely a key mode that people should start thinking about practicing. Because I think in the right conditions, as you'll see in this video, I think Alan, you were mentioning in a race you did as well. Yeah. yeah. You can make some big gains with this mode. Um, yeah. I think the conditions are probably around about you know 13 to 15 knots. Uh, when there's enough pressure to really run deep, uh, you can you know drive the main over it and uh, and go for the goose wing. Um, so that yeah, keep yeah run the video. And we can talk about the um, the sort of key yeah. points on there. It's probably the best. But yeah. Go ahead. So here we go. Yeah. So in this mode here. Obviously now you're running pretty much dead downwind. Um, so you're really looking to maximize sail area. So you want the main right out and you want to spread the kite out as much as you can. So here, uh, Ben Field, the tactician on Jelvis here, um, is doing a good job just with his foot, just pushing the sheet out a little bit further, just spreading that foot of the kite out a little bit further, uh, maximizing the, uh, the area that you can from, uh, from the asymmetric goose wind. Um, yeah, this is another video that Martin Dent from Jelva sent us. I have to thank him for all the videos he sent us through. It's fantastic. Um, yeah, so it seems like on the wing on wing, a couple of things that I've learned and, and we took away from this video is you have to have a decent wave state to do it where you're following. If it's from the side, it seems like unlike a J70, it's really hard to do on this boat because just it gets pushed everywhere um, is, my, is the one feeling. And, and I think, you know, for me is, is you got to start with, using this maneuver for mark roundings and tactics and build yourself up to potentially doing this for a couple minutes, a minute, you know, and then half a leg or whatever, if you decide to do it, because if you try from the get go, it could be pretty catastrophic when it's wrong. Yeah. I think it's something that they really need to practice. And I know that um, in, this was in a race situation when they did this and they were quite well back and um, they had you know, nothing to lose and they went for this uh, goose wing and the conditions were perfect for it and they made massive gains. Uh, yeah. You know, I think you rounded, them, you rounded the top mark sixth and the bottom mark second or something in this race. So yeah, huge gains here. Uh, but yeah, the conditions like you say have to be right for it. You want a nice flat sea stage so the boat's not rolling around too much. But I think if, it, you, need to, if you practiced it and work out, you know, 
how to steer to it. I think it's key here, the communication is really key between the trimmer and the driver. And I think, you know, rather than calling them up and down, I think in this sort of mode where you're running goose wing, you say more things like, um, yeah, no more right or no more left. And it's a bit easier to communicate that way. Yeah, I, I agree. Look how so, far that main is out. That is way out. It looks like the Vang might even be off a little, huh? Yeah, probably is because the spreaders are so swept back together around. That's you're hundred percent right. So you probably do have to ease the Vang a little bit, and you, he's probably to the knot on the main sheet to get it out far enough. Um, boom, almost to the thing. So, you know, what would you say the optimum wind strength is to do this? Probably twelve knots, something like that. Oh, did we lose Jeremy? Um, Might have. Yeah. Probably right around 12, yeah. 13. You know, the C state is is so critical. Uh, Agree. It's interesting in this video, if you look in the beginning, the mass to the horizon is just, you know, stable. And they're probably going pretty good. And towards the end of this video, they must be catching up because the tactician is starting to get a little anxious and they're, they're all starting to move around a little more. And <laughs> it's probably not as, as effective. Um, as we all know, who that once we've, we've tried this before, that if you collapse the spinnaker and getting it back full again, you can lose quite a bit of distance. But um, in the short tactical situations, I think it's great, you know, current, getting out of current, uh, not enough room to do two jibes, uh, maybe to get your position on a boat for room at the mark or something like that. I think it's great. Or, you know, as Jeremy pointed out, um, you know, if you're a ways behind, you may see some people do this, but I don't think many people that are ahead are, are going to do this right from the get go. No, I agree. I think this is a more often than not, it's a tactical weapon, not a, uh, uh, or a desperation move maybe than it is a normal mode, but, um, yeah, anyway, let, we'll keep moving here. So the next mode, uh, for the 111, that I actually think is the most fun and probably the most challenging is this. 16 to 20 knots where you're kind of planing but you're surfing and it's it's really working the moting and i know seeing you do this really well so if you could just talk us through a couple points and then i'll play the videos but i think this is probably the hardest and most fun and probably the most rewarding if you do it well mode that the boat has yeah absolutely um you know we'll, we'll kind of get into um a little more heavier planing shortly but but this mode is is just what would be sort of marginal planing, kind of figure it's around 16 to 20. And the key here is just keeping the boat consistently powered up, consistently level, um, not too much heel uh, and not too flat. And really the main trimmer has to play the main as sort of a, a level gauge in a, in a way. Um, you know, you over trim the main, pretty loose bang, but not too loose a bang where you're losing power. Um, obviously you see that the jib is up in this. And as you get the, as you get the puffs, that sort of 18, 20, really get the boat planing uh, is key. And then once the breeze sort of drops down, uh, where you come off the plane, you just have to keep the boat consistently moving along, not necessarily hunting for the, for the, the keep the boat on the plane but just waiting for the next puff to roll get the boat back on the plane and just keep playing it aggressively that way got it well let's go to let's watch the video here and while i'm loading the video we did get one question about do you ever cross sheet the spinnaker sheet to the windward winch um my answer to that is no and basically the reason for that is if because of the angle of the cabin house it's pretty easy to get an override on the windward winch so we usually stand the leeward cabin top winch for the spinnaker um i don't know if that's what you agree with seeden but yeah you know if you go I agree. one because of the slope of the deck you get an override yeah I, I agree with that i mean we've had a number of races where the crew on the boats <laughs> try to get fancy and they try to cross sheet and it's it's if you're going to be on that leg for a long time uh, a handicap race or so then sure it may make more sense but on a shorter course windward lured you know, I am all about simplicity and not having any mistakes. And so I just prefer not to cross sheet just to keep it simple. So here we have this video again uh, from the Jelvis guys and they're in the blue kite here. 
uh, jib still out and a couple boats soaking low, jibs down, um, and we can watch the video and see see how they gain and, and see. And you can tie us through a couple of things that they're doing differently that you know is making them go so fast. It's a pretty long video, um, but they're. The leaders are coming around the mark. I think uh, the Jolis is the one approaching the mark here, and then they go into this lazy planing mode, right? Yeah. Well, you see the the leaders are kind of sailing, setting, sort of not really sailing high enough to get planing, not really sailing low enough for for proper BMG. And what you see here is. Uh, Jelvis coming around pretty far back in the pack, and they commit to it to the planing mode early. Um, and I think that's that's one of the main things is you've got to know what you're going to do when you come around the mark. You, the guys up forward will generally ask me, you know, are we planning? Are we leaving the jib up or are we taking it down? I think you either go to BMG mode and the jib goes down, or you go to a little planing, lazy planing mode and you leave the jib up. But you can just see that. Jelvis here is committed to it, sailing a pretty straight but hot angle, left the jib up. Everybody goes right back to their positions on the rail aft in the boat. And you can see the boat just immediately picking up speed and starting to roll these boats to leeward. And looking at this video, you can see the guys to leeward are all of a sudden starting to notice like, oh, maybe we need to start sailing a little bit higher. But none of them have really firmly committed to it like Jelvis, and therefore they're losing uh, you know, a lot of speed or a lot of VMG. Um, but Jeremy's back and he knows, a, knows yeah. the conditions here a lot better. I'll let him say, talk about it a little bit. Yeah, sorry about that bit, but I'm staying with internet connection tonight. Um, but that's, is what it is. Yeah, in these conditions here, uh, Jelvis were able to sort of work on getting in this lazy plane mode where a lot of boats maybe before would have been sailing a slightly lower angle, uh, but really working hard to you know, keep the bow up and, and get the best BMG by sailing high. Um, and here you can see quite a nice set on the sails, They're leaving that J2 up in between the, the A4. Um, it's a really nice sort of twist profile between those three sails all working well together. And it, it really paid off for them here. They were able to sort of sail higher uh, well, not necessarily, they, they went higher initially, but then when they got the extra apparent wind, they actually came down and were sailing pretty much the same angle, but faster than the boats in front. So by going high and getting that speed, then when you get the apparent coming forward, then they could then get the bow down and uh, actually sail pretty much the same angles as the other boats, but slightly faster. Um, it's something they worked hard on and really paid off. <laughs> Yeah, so one of the questions we got, and I think we'll talk about this uh, going forward, um, and I'm going to switch to the next video because I believe it's on board the boat in this same situation, right? Yeah, that's um, right. So the next video is exactly the same shot, yeah, but so on board. Let's, let's go to that. Um, so here we go. This is on board. But while we're watching them set the kite here, or is loading, um, one of the questions was, how much do you think you'll lose jiving in this condition? for any of you guys there. To me, I think it's, if you execute it well, it's probably not that much, but when it goes bad, it's pretty bad. Is that a fair way to put it? <laughs> yeah. You have to really practice your planing jibes with the jib. Having the jib in there, um, it's easy to wrap the spinnaker. So you need to get the timing just right. Um, obviously you can lose a lot if with a poor jibe, but what you can gain by getting the boat committed to the lazy plane or planing is significantly more than you know what you could lose in a jibe. Well, and you're not going to jibe as much, right? Like, you're not going to jibe four times on a leg. You're only going to jibe once, right? You're like, you find your lay line, go a little short. If you're good, you're going to jibe once, but usually right. you're going to end up probably jibing, you know, twice. Right. And, it, it is and hopefully the second jive, you're, go ahead. Sorry, I was gonna say in these conditions, it's not massively windy. It's sort of, you know, 20 knots and under. So the, it's not too risky to jive, but when it gets to 25, 30 in these boats, and it's, a, it's the high risk maneuver where you, a good chance of spinning out. So you, then you definitely try and minimize it and uh, you know, not take that risk and just keep the boat going nice and fast. But in these conditions, you could, you know, you could put in three or four jibes on the run and not lose too much. So Jeremy, one thing is just in this video before we go to the next one, um, 
we're, we're running a little over time here, so we got to press on, is it looks like you got the jib pretty far out. So just give us a quick explanation of how you guys are doing yeah. that and why. So that's a key, that's a key point to keep the, um, keep the sails flowing nicely, uh, keep the, you know, the air flowing nicely over the kite and keep the jib trimmed properly is to have an outboard lead on it. So they would have, uh, on this boat, they would have attached outboard lead sheets to the jib and a little ratchet block just in front of the chain plates that then leads aft um, right back behind the helmsman here through a cleat uh, to the tactician. So as soon as they've borne away here, you probably saw earlier the tactician came back and he took the sheet and he took control of the jib there and he's trimming the jib down the run now from behind the helmsman and he will jibe the jib as well from behind the helmsman. So it just means that that clue of the jib is, is outboard more and you've got the jib trim better and setting nicer inside the uh, inside the main, inside the, um, the kite with the right amount of twist. And it's, it's really effective just to keep that yeah, keep that jib powered up, get that extra sail area working for you. Yeah, one of the things Alan will talk about in the next uh, presentation when we talk about more handicap stuff, uh, the, the, with the sprit pushing the kite out so far on this boat, you know, if you were going to build a spinnaker staysail to go inside of the the uh, yeah. the uh, chute, then it's it can be almost the size of the full size jib. So, so like this is a good look uh, to to actually you know sail with an extra sail downwind. Uh, and yeah, it, and it works right. fine, and it and it and it works with the kite because there's so much separation from the tack of the kite from the jib and the head state, it, it works quite well. Yeah. So one thing I'm just going to point out in the video, though, for the most part, you can really see that the, the, the boat in the video, how they're maintaining a constant angle of heel going downwind. And every now and then, the boat kind of gets flat when they press down on a puff over their competitors here. But there's not a lot of wheel movement. There's not a lot of uh, heel. Uh, and that's what's making this boat go so much faster than the guys to lured. If you see the guys to lured, they're out of balance. They're coming up aggressively. They're going down. Um, and, and they're a little out of balance by not having the jib. So, again, like the upwind, these boats just love the consistency of trim and heel angle. Yeah. Yeah. And what I would say before we move on to the next video, the last little thing on this one is it, it's a harder mode to sail this in the full, full planing mode. Uh, so yeah, a lot more work needed on the helm movement, um, just to sort of keep that angle of hill consistent, like you're saying. Right. And, and the is just a video. Is trimming it, right? Yeah. Yeah, that's right. So here's just showing, um, really just to show the outboard lead set up on the jib um, and how it's led back to the tactician there who's trimming it. So it's just, uh, you can see it's coming through a block at the chain plate and back down, back down the rail through another block or through the, through the cleat um, so the tactician can trim it there. And you see uh, sort of easing it and, and pulling it in the gusts. And as if this video plays on long enough, um, you see her trimming it through the jibe as well. So one of the questions that we had is crew weight. So in this breeze, it's let's say 18 to 20, you're not gonna be all the way back because it's not smoking windy yet, right? You're just in front of the driver because if it gets light, the boat would be, you know, dragging the stern in and you guys would actually probably get more behind the wheel if it got 22, 24, 25, is that accurate? Yeah, I think in these, in these sort of like um, lazy planing, you know, uh, just to get, just getting planing conditions, the crew with kinetics is key, you know, hiking out uh, but also where they are on the rail like you're saying they're not right at the back at the moment they're sort of they're, they're off but they're not fully back uh, like in the full playing mode um and that is again like you know key so you're not doing a wheelie down the race course you know getting that in that right amount of um true weight fore and aft and we're going into a jibe here we'll watch that real quick yeah so you're seeing the jibe here and these heavy air jibes that do a nice job here keeping the jib sheeted in and then letting it Blow straight across onto an ease sheet the other side to help the kite fill and uh, and get going straight away on the other jibe. And then once it's settled, then they'll sort of trim it in again. All right, we're going straight into a drop bit though. Yeah, let's go. We'll go to now to the 
the very windy part now. So well over 20, flat out planing the whole time. What, what's different than the lazy plane? Well, this sort of breeze, um, it's actually a bit easier to sail than the lazy plane here because you, you know you're going to be definitely planing the whole time. So you can commit to um, a high angle and just uh, really just try and keep, like what Stephen was saying just now, keep that angle of heel uh, really consistent. Um, and one thing that Jelvis did really well in the last couple of worlds was they were able to sort of sail right on edge. You know, they were really pressing it um, and setting us higher and faster angle than the other boats um, and getting that much more speed. But what, it, what they found is when they're getting that much speed, they also get the depth as well. So they were, they were really able to um, sail more on the edge. And I think that's the key to work on in this heavy air sailing, you know, finding that maximum amount of heel that you can hold before before it all goes terribly wrong. All right, let's go to the we'll go to the video here next here. So this is on board the boat blowing pretty hard. And then we have a couple we have after this we have two examples of off the boat, one really high and one going a little lower, I believe. Yeah, so this video, like Stephen was saying in the early video, it just shows a really nice um, consistent angle of heel that they're holding here. Uh, so they're fully planing, but this, the heel is really steady. And I'd say there's probably a bit even less helm movement now than there was in the lazy plane conditions because the helmsman's not having to steer up and down as much in the gust and lulls. He's able to keep the, you know, the boat more steady and really just lock into that angle of heel. Um, and J11 doesn't give you much feedback on the helm uh, so you don't really know how high, you know when when that broach is going to come. So knowing that angle of heel is is a real in key instinct to get from sailing the J111. Jeremy, it looks cold in this video. That's summer. Yeah, that is summer not, time. That, yeah, that, that does not that look the, warm. Yeah, that was the world's 2016 when the guys from Kashmir went out and bought new waterproof straight away. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. Right. That that that's what we call frostbiting here. <laughs> <laughs> No. All right. So let's go, let's go to the, this is off the boat. So this is, I think the Jelvis again in a bow up mode, if I recall correctly. Yeah. yeah really is, sending is, it here. They're really sending in this video. Um, and you can look, you know, they, they've got a, a nice amount of heel on and they're really, they're really pressing it along. You see them hit, hit a few gusts and come down, you know, maybe come down low just to sort of save it, but then they're straight away, pushing the bow back up again and getting that heel on and, and getting that speed going again. And you can see they're really trucking there. Look how well all three sails, the twist matches almost exactly. Yeah, yeah. Agree, Jack. It's super important, I think. Like yeah, having that thing. jib in too tight would just screw the whole thing up right here. Yeah. Well, I think the one thing, you know, in this is, as you mentioned before, we'll play one more time, is it's a fine line, right? You get a little too much heel, this boat is going to wipe out, right? I think, Seaton, you mentioned that, you know, yeah. but if you get too low, you're not going fast enough and the boat loads up, right? So it's a, it's a pretty right. fine line. It's, it's, a, it's a real fine line. Having the weight aft really helps with that. Um, you notice how loose the vang is on this in this shot, and that's that's critical. You want the vang really loose, um, just so you don't have any extra pressure on the helm, and you're really driving to this finnaker and the heel angle. Um, again, the jib helps balance the boat, keeps it tracking straight, but it, it adds a little bit of power. But you don't really need a lot more power, and this is just about keeping the boat balanced and really uh, driving to the spinnaker. Uh, when you feel the boat kind of load up that's when the helmsman needs to press down. That's when the main trimmer needs to drop the main sheet, dump it out, um, you know, but then, and then when the boat frees up, then all of a sudden things get a lot easier, but that the boat can go from free and moving very fast and full control to uh, loading up a little too much heel and then spin out very quickly. So when we get into this condition, um, you know, you, you, we tend to be a bit more conservative. It's just safer to be a bit more conservative than to really go hunting, uh, you know, to get the boat on maximum plane. I mean, in this condition, you're generally planing most any angle you're sailing, but what they're doing so nicely here is they're not sailing too low and they're not sailing too high hunting for the, for the breeze. They're just keeping the boat going consistent. 
Yeah, I think in this video here, it's, it's probably blowing about 30 knots. So yeah, there's a very small groove for, for the boat to sail in. But um, it, I think it is key to sort of just try and find that edge and just um, and explore how high you can go. Because I think there's some big gains to be made by sailing really high and fast. Um, here you've got another shot of a boat, same conditions, same boat, but um, sailing a lot sort of, um, you know, a lower angle. You know, still going pretty quick, but um, they haven't got that amount of heat, same amount of heel on that the, uh, the other boat that the Jelvis had, and they're um, you know they're saying fair bit slower as a result of it. And BMG is probably a fair bit worse. Yeah, and I think the one key to this condition is to realize that all eight people have an instrumental part of how this is going to work, right? I mean, you got the driver, you got the main trimmer, you got two people trimming the kite, you got someone trimming the jib. That's five people. You got a sixth person on the van. You have someone calling the puffs. You know, the eighth person's probably doing something to help one of the other. I mean, it really takes all eight people or you can't do this. You'll tip over. And, and yeah, that's absolutely. what I think is kind of cool about the boat is it's not a boat where four people are doing the work and everyone else is on for the ride. Like everyone has to be involved and, and participate and do their job well, or it just won't work. Yeah, absolutely. In these conditions, the boat is really rewarding to sail. Um, and yeah, if you've got a good crew work and good boat handling, yeah. you're going to get absolutely pay dividends. You're going to make massive gains uh, by just being really solid around the race course. Here's one little, uh, you know, good little video for everyone to watch about going into a jibe in this condition. And it, as someone was asking about what happens if you lose during a jibe, well, this is what happens when it goes poorly, right? I mean, it's a pretty aggressive wipe out there, but um, they actually recover pretty quick. Yeah, again, it was it's seriously windy conditions here, probably 30 knots. Uh, so jibing is really hard and, and getting that main over is key. And, and sometimes it just it just can't be done that well um and if the main doesn't come over then pretty much it results in the in the brooch here but what these guys do really well is a is a quick recovery all the crew are, you know near the back of the boat hiking hard to try and get the rudder back in the water to help the bear away the halyard's gone off and you know the kite is um is is depowered and then as soon as they get back down onto this angle they do a great job getting the um getting the halyard back up again nice and quick and okay. um and, and they off, still off might they cross again. and they still uh, might uh, cross a few of them yeah <laughs> yeah it's still pretty good shape <laughs> yeah exactly um so a couple uh things before we we kind of start wrapping this up um so in this when you wipe out you know what are the couple you know we're going to get into this more i think in part two of our j111 series but what are a couple of things that you guys think are keys when you wipe out there we got one question on that to me it's halyard off right yeah, it's it, you definitely have to commit to it right away, um, and and you'll, you know, it's hard to say, you know, at twenty three or twenty four knots, it's halyard off. You'll you'll know um, the condition if the boat is not recovering, that you got to commit to dumping the halyard right away. What I like to do is put a put a mark, you know, where it's maybe fifteen, twenty feet down. Uh, so that it's a no-brainer for someone to get to the halyard, you know, put a wrap on the winch or two, dump it to the mark, clutch it, you know, and then get everybody, you know, out on the rail, bear the boat off, and then get that kite back up. Got it. One of the questions uh, we got, Jeremy, um, is do you guys ever I blow mean, through jibes? It's definitely the key. Do you guys ever blow through or do outside jibes when it's this windy? Um, we never really outside jibe. We always... We generally always jibe through the gap, but um, the blow through jibe can be really tricky on this on these boats because the kite is pretty big and the gap that it's got to blow through is, is pretty small. Uh, yeah. So it doesn't really work. I think you're better just to, you know, you're playing along nicely and really commit to the jibe and, um, and just get that main over as quick as you can. And um, you like we saw in the earlier video, you keep the jib pinned in, let it blow out, blow through the other side and um, get the main over and then you're, you know, it should be okay. Um, don't really go for the outside jibe so much on the, on the J111 because the boat's fast enough that you can do that jibe through the gap okay. Got it. We spent a lot of time working on the outside jibe, um, but, it, but it's a commitment, and a lot of times these races don't usually start in 30 knots. And, uh, but they kind of end up in 30 knots uh, and you know, you're not going out there re-rigging your sheets as you're going upwind. 
Right. Uh, so that that's sort of the issue. Unless you know it's, you know, and maybe in England, San Francisco are two places where you know it's just going to be breezy from the get-go, um, you know, where you might set up for that. But a lot of times you're just not set up and you're going to make do with what you've got. But, yeah, we, we spent some time doing outside jibes, and it does work, but you do have the issue with the spinnaker sheet going underneath the sprit and under the bow and then, you know, having to yeah. deal with that. So th there are other factors to think about, but it definitely – is a maneuver that we worked on it's definitely if you're sailing in heavy air it's definitely something worth uh learning how to do got it um all right well uh thank you guys for all this stuff um let me get this to advance here because it doesn't like it when we sit for a while so uh looking forward we got a uh part two coming up um we're going to talk more about handicap sailing these boats, shorthanded sailing, handicap sailing with different type of uh, sails, sail charts, all these things. So um, look forward to that. I think Jack, when are we? Two weeks out, maybe. Something yeah, two like weeks, that. I believe, is is the call for that. Yeah, so two weeks out. Uh, you know, watch for the emails. We're going to be doing another talk on J111s, not necessarily class sailing, but more handicap and and other different types of sailing that the boat does really well. Um, but uh, the four of us, you know, really appreciate everyone taking the time to come listen and, and spend some, some quality time chatting some J111. If you guys need anything, um, our emails are up here on the screen. If you have another offshore one design that's not a J111, give Jack a call and he might be able to schedule a call for your class and get that all put together. So, um, you know, again, thank you guys for coming. We really appreciate it. And uh, we look forward to seeing you guys in a couple weeks. Thank you, guys. All right. Thank you, guys. Thanks, guys. Thank you, guys. Uh, can I just say thanks to the guys who uh, supplied the videos for us, like Sam Haynes and Louis Habib and Martin Dent did a, did a great job sending us those videos as well. Thanks, guys. Very yeah, they were. Yeah, awesome. very helpful. Thank you.